بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم All praises are Allah's, Lord of all worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate Ahlul Bayt Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad During the last few nights we've been discussing a number of noble ethical traits And last night we discussed shukr, being grateful. And tonight, inshallah, we want to cover the theme of haya, which is commonly translated as modesty. However, maybe humiliation may be a better translation. And we'll go through a number of traditions and discuss what we mean. Chapter 96, verse 14. Alam ya alam bi anna allaha yara. Does one not know that Allah sees? We've said before, in order to acknowledge Allah's grandeur, one must execute tafakkur, contemplation, deliberate on Allah, His attributes, His creation, and so on and so forth. In order to acquire Allah's love, we said one has to execute tadhakkur recalling Allah, remembering Allah with the heart, with the tongue and via action, practice now haya, this humiliation before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is realized once these two elements are actualized so the acquisition of haya is dependent on tafakkur that leads to one's ascertaining Allah's grandeur and tadakkur that leads to one loving Allah this grandeur which is acknowledged together with the love allows one to be modest before Allah to have that sense of humiliation before Allah so haya is this state of humiliation and embarrassment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it has two main degrees. The first degree is a function of the intellect, whereas the second degree is a function of the heart, of the fitra. The first degree is when one truly acknowledges that Allah is watching over him or her. The acknowledgement is important here, the first degree. One is in Allah's presence at all times. This fact is acknowledged. One has to try to acknowledge this. That one is present before Allah at all times. And this can be acquired via tafakkur. Tafakkur Allah, His attributes. Allah is eternal, infinite. Omnipresent and so on. What do these mean? In the first degree, we're acknowledging this important fact. Previous, two months ago when I was speaking on the f seven fundamental steps, the seventh was muraqibe, this constant scrutiny of one's actions on an action-to-action -action basis. There's a very fine synergy between muraqibah and haya. Haya can lead to an increase in one's muraqibah, in one's constant attention to one's actions. Every time one acts, one is attentive that Allah is watchful over one. Therefore, he refrains from the sins, and so on and so forth. Hayo can enhance one's muraqibah. Truly acknowledging that Allah is watchful over you can increase your sabr, your patience. Someone's looking over you. Truly acknowledging that someone is watching over you 
will enhance your tadakkur, especially the practical tadakkur where one refrains from sinning. If the acknowledgement is there that someone is watching over you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can enhance a lot of positive spiritual effects. Now, to support this first degree, there's a tradition by Imam Sajjad alayhi salam who said, Khafillah ta'ala la qudratihi alayk, fear Allah because of his power over you. And have humiliation before him due to his proximity to you. Acknowledging this proximity of Allah to you, have humiliation before him. Be modest. Be embarrassed. Allah is watching over you. So this was the first degree. Now this first degree was a function of the intellect. Whoever does tafakkur with the intellect should be able to reach this first degree. With tafakkur you attain to ilmul yaqeen. You are certain by means of your tafakkur, by means of knowledge that Allah is near you. You have ilmul yaqeen. However, in this second degree, now you want to acquire Ainul Yaqeen, that Allah is close to you. Before you had acquired Ilmul Yaqeen, that Allah is near to you, in this second degree, you want to acquire Ainul Yaqeen, that Allah is close to you. You feel Allah now. Now, what do I mean by feeling Allah, sensing that Allah is near? I'm sure you've all heard of the tradition where there was a non-believer discussing with Imam Sadiq salam, on the existence of God. The Imam Sadiq said, have you ever encountered the situation where you're on a ship during a stormy weather, you're about to capsize, did you feel anything? Did you call out to anyone? And the non-believer said, yes, I did, I did call out, I had that feeling. Then Imam said, that was Allah, you called Allah. But then, the non-believer usually, when he returns to a state of ease, forgets Allah. It's only a temporary moment of Ainul Yaqeen. But here in this second degree, we want to acquire this persistent Ainul Yaqeen that Allah is in close proximity to us. Now, how is this proximity acquired? And we've discussed this many times that this proximity is only acquired via the refinement of the fitra. The fitra has to be refined. And that's via practical tadakkur, action. Abiding by the sharia. That's the sole root of refining the fitra. And it's this not sinning that unveils the veils which cover the fitra which prevent the fitra in seeing Allah. It's this process of not sinning that enables you to unveil the fitra in order to be able to see Allah. Ainul Yaqeen. Supporting this second degree, there's a tradition by the Holy Prophet of Islam who said, Istahi min Allah, istihya have humiliation before Allah. Istihya'aka, the proper way of having humiliation. Do it the proper way. In the same way that you have this humiliation before before your righteous neighbor. You have a neighbor who's very righteous, a true believer. You don't do anything before the neighbor. You're embarrassed to do anything. You have humility. You possess this sense of humiliation. You don't do anything. You must have this sense of humiliation before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too. 
فَإِنَّ فِيهَا Doing this, in this humiliation, if you do practice it, زِيَادَةَ الْيَقِينَ There'll be an increase of yaqeen. Now this increase of yaqeen can either mean an increase from one ilm al to a higher state of ilm al or from ilm al you're upgraded to ain al فَإِنَّ فِيهَا زِيَادَةَ الْيَقِينَ So here now, you feel, you sense this humiliation before one who is watchful over you. Now, the Imams have given a precise definition of Haya in the traditions. Imam Sadiq has said, Al Haya tafsiruhu at tathabbutu in the kulli shay yunkiruhu at tawheed wal ma'rafa. Haya, its definition, is guarding oneself from all that is not in harmony with Tawheed and Gnosis, Ma'rafa. Guarding yourself against all that is not in harmony with Tawheed and which is not in harmony with Ma'rafa. This is a very important definition of Haya. How can we attain to this knowledge? How can we understand what is in harmony with Tawheed and in Ma'rafa and what isn't in harmony with Tawheed and Ma'rafa? And after acknowledging what isn't in conformity with Tawheed and Ma'rafa, how can we guard ourselves from that? This attaining to this knowledge is very important. There's a verse in the Holy Quran which reads, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانِ إِلَى تَعَامِهِ So let man observe his food. What, what is this food? Someone asked this to Imam Baghir alayhi salam, مَا تَعَامُهُ What's meant by this food in this verse? Imam Baghir salam said, "Ilmuhu alladhi ya'khudhuhu mimman ya'khudhuhu." Where has he acquired this knowledge from? Observe the food you eat. Observe who you're receiving this food from. Imam is saying the food here is tantamount to knowledge. This is the esoteric meaning of this verse. But the Imam, the Ma'asum Imam is telling us this. You have to observe where you receive your knowledge from. You can't just receive knowledge from anywhere. True, we do have traditions which say acquire knowledge even from the hypocrites. That's when in states of urgency, out of necessity, that's the last course of action. It's not the first course of action. Or traditions which say, acquire knowledge even if it means going to China. Well, if that knowledge can be acquired in your hometown, there's no need to go to China. You have to be careful where, who you're receiving this knowledge from, this ta'am from. Tawheed and ma'rafir, you can't acquire them from any person, from any source. You have to be careful. Falyandur. So Haya is a process of guarding oneself from all that is not in harmony with Tawheed and Ma'rafa. So here the importance of Tafakkur is evident here. Without Tafakkur, Haya will never be actualized. You'll never be a person with Haya. This is the importance of Tafakkur. You have to understand Tawheed. And that's why Imam Ali, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam has said Al-Haya sababun ila kulli jameel Haya is a means to all virtues 
Why? Because whatever virtue there is emanates from Tawheed. Haya is a means to all virtues because Haya is a person of guarding oneself against whatever is not in harmony with Tawheed. So Haya must be a means to only virtue. It can't lead to anything else if it's done properly. The Holy Prophet of Islam said, Al Haya la yakti illa bi khair. Haya leads to nothing but virtue. It's because of that tathabbut, it's because of that guarding oneself against everything which is against Tawheed, against Ma'rifah. Now, the incredible thing is, in this next tradition, Haya is described as the ultimate of the noble ethical traits the peak of the noble ethical traits. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, Inna khisal al makara Verily, the noble ethical traits are as follows. Sidq al hadith Being truthful in your words. Sidq al nas Being truthful to people in your behavior. إِعْتَاءُ sail Donating to those in need, those who ask things from you. وَالْمُكَافَأَةُ بِالسَّنَاعِ Repaying other people's good deeds with good, compensating for others' good, good deeds. وَعَدَاءُ amana Being trustworthy. وَسِلَةُ rahim Maintaining family relations. وَالتَّوَدُّدُ إِلَى الْجَارِ وَالسَّاهِبِ Having bonds of affection, being affectionate towards your neighbor and your partner at work, for example. Being affectionate towards your neighbor. Your neighbor may be a Muslim, may be a non-Muslim, but you have to be affectionate. وَقِرَتْ ذَيْفِ Hospitality. Doesn't matter if it's towards a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Wara'suhunna. At the peak of the pyramid of these noble ethical traits, al haya Now, why should this be? Why should haya be at the peak? Because with haya Allah is always with you and you see this the atheist Allah is also always with the atheist but the atheist ignorant of this but you've succeeded to acquire this certainty either ilmul yaqeen or aynul yaqeen that Allah is watchful over you if concerning haya fayatashabu minhu alim emanating from haya those people who have haya emanating from them is gentle behavior, a soft temperament. They're very gentle with you. They're not harsh. They're not disrespectful. They speak with you with respect, with dignity. They treat you gently. They treat their husbands, their wives, their children. Some people don't know how to speak. Some people don't know how to speak with their wives, with their husbands, with their children. That's because there's no haya. If there was haya, they wouldn't have spoken to their wives like that. They wouldn't have spoken to their parents like that. There's no haya. ar Compassion emanating, emanating from Haya. One was lean, gentle behavior. Arrafa, compassion in absolute terms. Compassion towards plants, compassion towards animals, compassion towards human beings, compassion towards Muslims. Compassion towards plants. Some people, you know, when they sit on grass or 
You see them picking the grass out and damaging the plants and everything. There's no hayo. This it all relates to the degree of hayo they have. Otherwise there's no need to destroy plant life. With animals, you have to treat them with compassion. I once was walking by that street in Tehran and there was a cat up a tree and there were a few brothers throwing big stones at the cat. That's their level of hayo. If one truly had hayo, they would have compassion towards the cat. They wouldn't want to harm the cat. And then humans, be they Muslim or not, you can always judge your own hayo in how you, how you treat other human beings. Never mind how you treat Muslims. وَالْمُرَاقَبَةُ لِلَّهِ فِي السِّرِّ وَالْعَلَانِيَةِ Also emanating from hayo is the process of constantly being attentive to Allah's commands, be it in the public or in private. Allah is watchful over you. Some people in the public they pray one way, but in private they pray another way. See, there's no haya there. They speak with their parents in public one way, but in private they treat their parents another way. There's no muraqabe, they're not constantly attentive to their actions. Only with haya can that muraqabe be enhanced. Wassalama, health. Emanating from Haya is health. Now, why should health be a consequence of Haya? Because one controls one's nutritional regime, doesn't keep on overeating. If one has Haya and Allah's watching over him, he controls his eating. Controlling one's food leads to one's health, good health. Controlling one's sexual appetite. If one truly watch, believes that Allah is watchful over one, they won't overdo it and therefore have, have a healthy life. And so on and so forth. Wassalama. Wajtenabu shar. Refraining from sins, from vice. Because you won't dare sin if you believe that Allah is watching over you. The problem is there's no haya. You don't believe Allah is watching you. There's no yaqeen. Neither ilmul yaqeen nor aynul yaqeen. Until that yaqeen, that initial yaqeen isn't acquired, the future prospects doesn't seem, won't seem very sound. You have to Make an effort. Wala basha I think basha means being happy at heart. I wasn't sure about this, the definition of basha but I think it means being happy at heart. Those who have haya, they're happy individuals. They're happy with this relationship they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very sweet if one has that yaqeen that Allah is watchful over one. It becomes sweet after a while. Wasamaha, forgiving. Allah is watchful over you. If someone does something wrong, for Allah's sake, you forgive them. If you don't have a forgiving nature, again, it's because of a deficiency in your haya. Otherwise, if you really believe that Allah is now watching over you, you'll forgive everyone. For Allah's sake. Because you have yaqeen Allah is seeing it. وَالزَّفْرُ وَحُسْنُ الثَّنَاءِ عَلَى الْمَرَأِ فِي النَّاسِ You'll be victorious and well-known amongst the people. 
people will be attracted to you. People are attracted to people are attracted to people who are with Allah. You'll be well known amongst the people. You'll be liked. فَهَذَا مَا أَصَابَ الْأَقِلْ بِالْحَيَاءِ And this is what the aqil, the rational person, will acquire by means of haya. فَتُوبَ لِمَنْ قَبِلَ نَسِيحَةَ اللَّهِ وَخَافَ فَضِيحَةَ How fortunate are those who accept Allah's advice and fear His slander, His reproach. Also, this, this sacred divine tradition where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abdi, my servant. If you possess and acquire humiliation before me, and say to nasa you back, I'll make people forget your errors. This is Allah saying this. This is one of the consequences of having hayah. And say to nasa you back wa biqa al arad adhunu back. I'll make the people forget your errors and I'll make the earth forget your errors too. وَمَحَوْتُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ زَلَّاتَكْ I'll erase your errors from the book of accounts, the book of your deeds on the day of resurrection. وَلَا أُنَاقِشُكَ الْحِسَابِ يَوْمَ الْغِيَامَةِ I won't keep on criticizing your a'mal on the day of judgment. You had haya. I'll forgive you a lot. You may have done some errors, but I'll forgive you because of that haya. Imam Baghir salam narrates that the Holy Prophet of Islam said, Istahyu min Allah haqq al haya. Have that humiliation in the proper sense of the word before Allah. Faqila ya Rasulallah wa man yastahi min Allah haqq al haya. Then it was said to the Prophet of Islam, Who is this? Who's the one who has this humiliation in the proper way before Allah? Faqal, the Holy Prophet of Islam said, Man is tahya min Allah haqq al haya. That person who has true humiliation before Allah is the following. Fal yaktub ajalahu bayna aynay. You must recall death, the appointed term, before your eyes constantly. If you want to practice true haya, you have to constantly recall death. While yaz had fit dunya wazinataha, you have to be ascetic towards the world and the glitter of the worldly life. Drowning in the world in life won't allow you to have haya. You have to be careful with respect to your head and the contents of your head, your thoughts. You have to be careful. Don't think anything. It has to be monitored. While a batna wa ma wa take care of what your stomach and the contents of your stomach, what you're eating, how you're eating, how much you're eating. Wala yan salamakabira wal bela and they don't forget one's graves and one's rotting away one day. This is how to attain to true humiliation. With muhasebe, self-accounting, which we have to do at least once a day, just account for your own deeds and how much you have this haya, how much you practice haya every day. You'll get a good picture of how much haya you have. 
أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام سيد أحسن الحياة استحياؤك من نفسك The best form of haya is being humiliated before your own self Some people don't even have haya in relation to themselves They don't even respect themselves, don't have no dignity غاية الحياة أن يستحيى المرء من نفسه The ultimate of The ultimate haya is when you have that humiliation before your own self because if you're truly humiliated of what you are then you'll manage to eliminate all traces of the ego but the less you're humiliated you're giving more room for the ego and that will be the start of your spiritual downfall Yeah, so you have to be humiliated with respect to the nafs. This nafs has to be preserved. It has to be controlled. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum. Alaykum here is a verbal noun. Alzimu. Keep Keep within the soul, preserve it, don't look elsewhere. If there's a solution to your spiritual wafering, it's your nafs. Alaykum and fusakum. Don't go here or there. It's with you. You have to control it by means of hayat. Now there are two types of haya. One's a rational type and one's an irrational type. Naturally, so far we've been discussing the good rational type. The Holy Prophet of Islam said, Al haya haya on. Haya can be classified into two types, two classes of haya. Haya o aqlin wa haya o humqin. Haya of the intellect of one's rationality haya of stupidity humq and I'll explain what this means in a minute haya al-ilm the haya of the intellect is acting with knowledge haya al-humq al The haya of stupidity is acting ignorantly. Some people have haya in relation to the wrong things. They have haya which prevents them from acquiring knowledge, prevents them from asking what's halal, what's haram. No, that's the wrong type, that's the irrational haya. Imam Sadiq, no, sorry, Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam said, Man istahya min qawl al-haq, one who is humiliated in relation to the truth, he doesn't want to approach the truth, he's a bit embarrassed with respect to the truth, فَهُوَ أَحْمَاق, he's stupid. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, Man raqqa wajhuhu, raqqa ilmuhu, Being embarrassed, being timid, may lead to a decrease in your knowledge. It leads to a decrease in your audacity, in attaining to true ilm. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said, قُرِنَةِ الْحَيْبَةِ بِالْخَيْبَةِ Complaining is accompanied with despair. But this part is what I want to say. Well, haya bil hirman. Humiliation is accompanied with suppression. Al haya, sorry, this haya is accompanied with suppression. This is haya of the irrational type. Because some types of haya 
leads to you becoming more and more suppressed. That's the irrational hayo. So when you peruse through the traditions and come up with hayo, you have to first differentiate which hayo is being referred to. Al hayo, Imam Ali says, Al hayo yamna or rez. This irrational type of hayo can even prevent you in acquiring sustenance. Okay, now that ends my discussion on hayo. Only one last point on hayo. It's a story concerning Hazrat Musa alayhi Chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. Qala Rabbi, ishrah li sadri. Expand my breast for me, O Lord. This is Prophet Musa saying this. He's been given revelation and now he wants to go to Pharaoh, to the Pharaoh, after receiving revelation from Allah. Expand my breast for me. Wa yassirli amri. Facilitate my affair. Facilitate my affair for me. Make things easy for me. This is the important part. Wahlul uqdatam min lisani. Loosen the knot from my tongue. Yafqahu qawli. So that they may understand my words. What does this mean? Loosen the knot from my tongue. It's incredible. Some people have written that Hazrat Musa wasn't very fussy. He could he had a problem in speaking. I've heard this with my own ears. That's, that can't be the meaning. Hazrat Musa was ma'asum. He was perfect. He's a, per, a complete manifestation of Allah's attribute, al mutakallim How can his tongue be knotted? And they say he wasn't fussy. So he gets help from Harun. You can't compare the Iman of Musa with Harun. They're both prophets. They're both ma'asum. But the importance of Musa is one step higher than Harun. Here, the esoteric meaning of the verse concerns Haya. After receiving revelation from Allah, after speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had this humiliation to speak with Fir'aun. You know, from, from the realm of divinity, then to speak with Fir'aun. He had haya. Hazrat Musa had haya to, in, in relation to speaking with Fir'aun. When I'm speaking with Allah, now I have to speak with Fir'aun. This is difficult for me. I'm embarrassed to speak with Fir'aun after speaking with Allah, after hearing Allah. This is what he wanted, the, the assistance. He wanted assistance here from Allah. Expand my breast, breast for me. I'm humiliated to go to her uh, Pharaoh. So this verse concerns Haya. It shows this, the magnanimity of Musa alayhi salam. His high degree of Haya. When we read the maqtas of Hazrat Fatima alayhi salam, Hazrat Fatima alayhi salam was a ma'asum. A ma'asum can control herself. When we see that Fatima to Zahra says, Oh Allah, end my life. Of course she, she's not suicidal. When she cries a lot, of course she was able not to cry. Of course she's ma'asum. But why did she express her sorrows? Why some of the statements she said, she had to disclose them. History had to show one day about the utmost and utter tragedy that occurred during that time. We would have never known what would have happened 
if Hazrat Fatima didn't disclose these facts. Of course she didn't want to die. But the statements when she says, end my life, it indicates the importance of the zulm which was occurring there. Not that she wanted to die. Her cries, her lamentations indicate the zulm which was occurring. Otherwise, she is sabur, 100%. She's ma'asum, we shouldn't confuse these things. I can just read five minutes of maqtal and I'll finish. Once Her Holiness, Hazrat Fatima, said, I desire to hear the adhan of my father's mu'adhan. When this news reached Bilal's ears, Bilal came and read the azan. When he reached the close, Ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. When Bilal reached the close in the azan, Fatima alayhi salam started wailing and fell to the ground unconscious. In the absence of the Holy Messenger and the oppressions committed against her, she cried and extensively exhibited her sorrows to the whole world. This is the narrator of this, is saying this. Sometimes she would cry so much her eyes would no longer see anything. She would weep so much that the people of Medina approached Amir al-Mu'mineen and told him to tell Fatima either to cry during the day or during the night. When Her Holiness was informed of what the people had said, she said, I have nothing to do with the people of Medina. This heart is so full of sorrow that I can't act in any other way. I shall be departing them soon anyway. Then Amir al Mu'minin went and built a bower, an arbor like place, far away from the dwellings in the cemetery, which was later called Beitul Ahzan, the house of sorrow. Walam yakun bayn al jami ashaddu huznan min mawlatina Fatimat al Zahra. فَقَدْ دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا مِنَ الْهُزْنِ مَا لَا يَعْلَمُهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ The narrator says, no one was as sorrowful as Fatima amongst the people. Sorrow and grief had encompassed her to such an extent that no one but Allah can appreciate the depth of this sorrow. And then the narrator says that Fatima to Zahra said the following, إِنَّ حُزْنِي عَلَيْكَ حُزْنٌ جَدِيدٌ وَفُؤَادِي وَاللَّهُ سَبٌّ عَنِيدٌ كُلُّ يَوْمٍ يَزِيدُ فِيهِ شَجُونِي وَاكْتِيَابِي عَلَيْكَ لَيْسَ يَبِيدٌ Hour by hour, day by day, my sorrow increases. My lamentations neither reduce nor die down. I swear by Allah, the burning of my heart just doesn't calm down. It doesn't become relieved. Ya abato, man lil aramile wal masakin, wa man lil ummate ila yawmiddin. O Father, after you, who should spinsters and the poor refer to in your absence? Who is there to respond to the cry of the Ummah until the day of resurrection? Ya abato amsayna ba'daka min al After you they weakened us. They made us mustaz'af. Ya abato asbahat nas anna mu'radin They've turned away from us, O Father. فَأَيُّ دَمْعَةٍ لِفِرَاقِكَ لَا تَنْحَمِلُوا وَأَيُّ حُزْنٍ بَعْدَكَ لَا يَتَّسِلُوا 
In your absence, O Messenger of Allah, all tears are but flowing. All sorrows persist and continue to be. And after you, who can sleep? Who can sleep with ease? فَمَنْ بَرُكَ بَعْدَكَ مُسْتَوْهِشْ Your pulpit, your manbar is horrified as to who wants to occupy it. فَمِحْرَابُكَ خَالٍ مِنْ مُنَاجَاتِكْ وَقَبْرُكَ فَرَهٌ بِمُوَارَاتِكْ Your mihrab is disappointed that you're no longer here to pray, whilst your grave is happy that it's covering you. فَوَا أَسَفَا عَلَيْكَ إِلَا أَنْ أَقْدَمَ عَلَيْكَ I shall be in sorrow during this time that precedes my unity to you. Then the narrator said, ثُمَّ زَفَرَتْ زُفْرَةً وَأَنَّتْ أَنَّهُ كَادَتْ رُوحُهَا أَنْ تَخْرُجْ She then cried out loud to such an extent that her spirit was almost becoming detached from her body. And then Fatima alayhi salam said the following: "Qalla sabri wa bana anni azai ba'd faqdi li khatam al-anbiya." My patience has ended. My sorrow disclosed after losing the seal of the prophets. Ainu ya ain uskubi adam asaha wakilatan la tabhali bafaydid dama. O eyes, O eyes, constantly produce tears and cry. Woe upon you! You must cry to such an extent that you weep blood. Ya Rasul Allah, Ya Khirat Allah, Wa Kahf al-Eitam wa Du'afa Lau tara al-manbar al-ladhi kuntu ta'alu a'ala ad-dalam ba'd ad-diya O Prophet of Allah, O Selected One O refuge for the poor and needy. Woe upon seeing your pulpit and the fact that oppression has replaced the former luminosity that it used to have. Ya ilahi ajjil wa fati sari'a qad tanaqqasat al hayatu ya mawla. Assign my death as quickly as possible because the life in this world has lost all its life.